it's uh, so great to be together again. And uh, again, hopefully you're doing great wherever you are tuning in from on this beauty morning, the sunny morning together. It's actually a day we're really excited to be celebrating uh, and joining in on Freedom Sunday. And Freedom Sunday is something run by International Justice Mission, where they're just rallying churches around the idea of uh, learning and growing in our understanding of their work and ultimately modern day slavery with some of the things that are going on in our world. IJM is doing an amazing job at tackling um, these issues and these um, and just what's going on in our world and we're gonna learn more about that today and I'm really excited just to have a whole time together here today that's really gonna be shaped uh, around helping us as a community as as a people just to learn more about this we're right now really focusing in on uh, biblical justice and what this means and more than just justice or social justice being a buzzword one of the things we're really hoping for is that it would be something deep down in our bones just as in the nature and character of God uh, is justice and righteousness. One of the things we're going to be talking about, we have talked about and will be talking about, is really the call for the church to embody justice and righteousness, just as it's the character of God. Now this should flow from us as people who follow God. And so today we're going to join in on a few things. One of the things that's really cool is there's actually somebody, a part of our community that works for International Justice Mission. His name is Cam Phillips. I don't know if everybody knows Cam, um, but Cam is a great guy. Cam and Laura uh, came to London, I think a couple years ago now, and are actually both working in the not-for-profit sector, kind of the not-for-profit Christian sector, uh, with Laura working at Compassion and Cam doing a great job at International Justice Mission. And what I thought we would do is just take a couple minutes minutes and Cam is actually going to help introduce in a, in a couple minutes the rest of our time together. And as we kind of develop and grow in this, I thought it would be good to hear from Cam and his work. So uh, the beauties of uh, technology here. It's great to have you here. Um, here's what I thought you could do. Maybe is just share a little bit for a second about your work at IJM and kind of what you do for the ministry. Yeah, for sure. Um, so for those of you who don't know much about IJM, uh, we've been around for about 22 years or so. Uh, we work in 13 countries around the world. We have 21 offices uh, around the world as well. Um, so basically what we do is trying to prevent uh, violence against people who are poor. Um, we see tons of organizations around the world who are uh, you know, international aid or development organizations. Uh, and we really believe as part of uh, providing aid and development in the developing or the majority world is to help protect people from violence uh, and slavery. Um, so what that looks like is we partner with government agencies, with not-for-profits, uh, different sort of government actors, whether they're police or otherwise, uh, and rescue and restore people who are trapped in forms of violence. Often this looks like uh, human trafficking, slavery, uh, violence against women and children. Um, we also partner with sort of aftercare, social workers, um, all kinds of different agencies providing uh, healing and recovery, uh, especially when it comes to, to trauma and that, that kind of thing uh, for survivors of violence. And then finally, we try to strengthen justice systems uh, around the world um, so that people can't get away with these uh, terrible crimes. And um, yeah, sort of the, that's sort of the preventative uh, element of work. Um, yeah, so so my work in particular with IJM, uh, I've been with the organization for about two and a half years. Um, and right now, my role is kind of in the, the role of actually mobilizing the church in Canada uh, to care about, uh, to get involved in issues of, of justice, social justice, biblical justice, whatever you want to call it. Um, really mobilizing the church to um, find ways to act in their community and locally here in Canada, but also to um, really open up people's eyes to the reality that there are 40 million people trapped in slavery today. Um, and so mobilizing people, whether it's with, um, you know, their finances or prayer or, or just different ways of getting involved in this fight to end slavery. Um, so I do lots of uh, sort of communications and marketing to churches, lots of writing, uh, video editing, um, putting together resources. So a lot of the stuff we'll be using today uh, is stuff that I've worked on. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of in a nutshell uh, what I get up to. I support regional people as well who work across Canada who do like speaking and engaging with 
with churches and that kind of thing. So, so yeah. good. Uh, take a second. Why? Why? Because I know your story a little bit, and know you're super passionate about this, which is so cool. But where did that come from? Like, why are you particularly passionate about justice in our moment, justice and righteousness, and what maybe what did that stem out of for you? Yeah. Um, no, it's a good question. It's something I've been reflecting a lot on lately. Um, you know, was raised uh, was raised in a Christian home. Uh, my mom was very involved with World Vision. Uh, she would, uh, you know, do kind of mission trips with World Vision uh, when she was young, and she would tell us kids growing up about that. And always had, you know, sponsoring kids through World Vision. Uh, you know, having their pictures up on the fridge. So kind of always had kind of a I guess understanding of poverty, maybe in the in in the majority world, not necessarily in Canada. Grew up in a fairly middle class, very rural, but you know, middle class setting. Um, I think what I, I I don't know. I'm an Enneagram one. I don't know if anyone else out there is an Enneagram one, but having really having that strong drive towards you know fairness and justice and equality, like that's just been I don't know instilled in me from a very young age. Um, but in terms of connecting it to my faith, um, you know, like I said, I grew up in a Christian home, but we didn't really talk a whole lot about, you know, Jesus's teachings on justice or, you know, the Old Testament prophets, you know, preaching about justice against, um, you know, the powers that be in their time. Um, it wasn't really until I had gone off to university where I actually really started to understand uh, the connection of our, of our faith with action. Um, so I just started getting involved in different sort of uh, downtown ministries. I went, I went to school at Redeemer University in Hamilton. So uh, getting involved in stuff in downtown Hamilton, doing like fundraisers for water projects, um, you know, uh, advocacy programs for indigenous rights, um, all kinds of different little things. Um, and I think that's kind of how, you know, everyone Kind of gets involved in this work is this little bit by bit little piece by piece of like oh i want to do something with this or i want to do something with that um it definitely i never thought it would really lead to uh like a full-time job doing this kind of work but you know i'm really thankful to be here and now i, I think what's really encouraging now is seeing you know churches like praxis and even other churches across the city across canada really across the world um really trying to want to understand this call to do justice. I think especially in um, in the evangelical church, that's something we haven't really focused on, at least lately in the past maybe 50, 100 years. Um, some more of the, like, the mainline churches, um, you know, are pretty involved in, in the work of justice, social justice kind of stuff. But I think, yeah, I'm just really encouraged to see so much even just churches here in London doing so much preaching about justice, but also wanting to get involved uh, on an international level and local level as well. Um, so, yeah. Cool. Cool. Um, you know, one of the things that you've shared is just the numbers of people caught in slavery. It may be easy for some of us uh, to think, especially in more, more Western middle class context think oh that you know that was something long ago and not realize uh, the current moment so my, you know, one of the questions I, I would love for you to maybe take two seconds to just share about is what would you say to people who may lack an awareness that modern day slavery exists today you know uh, all of us come from different positions and and have different stories and backgrounds what, what would you say if there's maybe not that type of awareness in somebody's life yeah I mean I think often when we hear about uh, human trafficking or, or, or slavery, we think about um, like the movie Taken with Liam Neeson, which is a great movie. But um, yeah, slavery today, actually, there are 40.3 million people trapped in slavery today. It's actually the most pe that people have ever been in slavery in our, in our history. Um, it's just incredible how, how prevalent it is and how little that we're really aware of it. I mean, this conversation is growing. We're starting to see uh, more legislation and governments around the world. I mean, we're even seeing headlines about uh, the Uyghur population in China um, who are kind of being trapped into forced labor by their own government. Um, but yeah, there's really a prevalence, particularly in, um, so in countries that we work in like India, we see this in forms of, uh, whether it's people making bricks, people trapped in, um, sort of like lumber yard kind of wood cutting facilities 
Uh, but it also takes a form in, you know, the technology sector, uh, you know, where people are being forced to uh, make electronics. And especially, I think we see that in the garment industry as well, where we've just seen so many people uh, trapped in, lab in forced labor, uh, which I think it really has implications for us here in Canada in terms of the clothes that we buy, you know, the technology that we use. Um, and I think I, I also just want to preface, like if I, I do apologize if some of these things are triggering uh, to people. Um, and also if there are children in the room, like just be aware that some of this content is going to be um, heavy and sure. may not be appropriate for some younger kids. Um, so in particular, when I um, another area that we see sort of modern day slavery is actually over the internet. Um, so uh, a, a big type of casework that we work on with IJM is called um, the Online Sexual Ex Exploitation of Children or OSEC. Uh, we also call it cyber sex trafficking. Um, and a, a real hotspot for that is actually in the Philippines. And I got to visit the Philippines just about, uh, just over a year ago uh, to really understand that crime. Um, and it's not, it's, it's actually way more common than you would expect. Um, it's not really done, I mean, it is done through like the dark web and all kinds of like sketchy stuff like that, but it's also just done through Facebook and Instagram over Skype, Zoom, like, um, so with our work with cyber sex trafficking, um, we're really trying to partner with, you know, government agencies in the Philippines, but also with like, we've partnered with the RCMP, we've partner partnered with the FBI, um, really trying to stop the demand uh, for um, child sexual exploitation material, unfortunately named child pornography, but we kind of don't use that term because it's not very accurate, um, but, yeah, really trying to understand the demand side for that particular form of slavery. Um, actually, one of the worst instances of, uh, of a, a predator um, involved in this crime is actually Canadian. Uh, so when I was in the Philippines, you know, meeting, meeting our staff there, meeting police partners, telling them I'm from Canada, and they would be like, oh, like one of our worst offenders that we actually helped track down was in Canada. Um, he was a school teacher in Saskatchewan. Um, and yeah, with our collaboration with the RCMP, with our work in the Philippines, we're actually able to rescue the children in the Philippines that he was kind of directing the live abuse through. Uh, that was often through their parents or through people in the neighborhood. Um, but we're also able to work with the RCMP here to actually um, bring him to court and um, yeah, put him away. So. Huh. Yeah. Amazing, amazing uh, work that you do. And I know I've heard stories over the last, you know, year or two, and uh, we're appreciative of your work. Um, you know, one of the things we want to do, everybody, is actually as part of our fall outreach is uh, put a little bit of money from our own community into IJM. And so we we just like to commit as a team about $500 from our fall budget. And so this is just a reminder. Oh, man. And this is just a reminder to everybody that, you know, one of the, the, the economy we're trying to create and have always tried to create with Praxis is that... Um, um, to live simply enables us to do some things. And obviously we have a fallout reach locally, but we wanted to do that. So uh, just a reminder to those of you that contribute, thank you. And this this just puts it into a, a practice as far as um, helping. And, and we're just really thankful for the work you do. Let's talk about this for a second, because I know there's a conference coming up that you've had a big part in uh, called it's Jesus and Justice Conference. It's virtually, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Let's do it now. I know we said at the end we were going to do this, but just share how, you know, people can get involved with that. Yeah, definitely. That's uh, that's kind of been my my baby the past few months is this conference. Um, yeah, no, this is the, the third annual uh, Jesus and Justice conference that IJM's been hosting. Um, and this is actually the first uh, entirely online version uh, that we've hosted. And obviously we're doing that because of COVID and everything happening in the world. Um, but basically, it ex it, this conference, conference exists just to really um, encourage people in, in Canada, encourage the church in Canada to just really stay involved in the work of justice and really uh, encouraging people wherever they're at. So whether it's if they want to be involved in something locally, uh, in their own city or nationally or internationally, um, really it's a conference just to challenge, but just really encourage people uh, to stay, stay in the fight. Um, for justice like this isn't just I think issues of justice um, you know they can be, almost become trendy I mean we see corporations putting out you know slogans like Black Lives Matter which is amazing but to be consistent in that I think is really important 
And I think that's what, that's my prayer for the Canadian church is to be consistent in our work for justice, to keep saying, you know, stuff like Black Lives Matter and acting on that, um, to, you know, say that we believe in ending slavery and acting on that. Um, so yeah, it's a conference that, um, you know what, I'm actually gonna drop the URL right in the chat because we can do that. Awesome. With technology. Yeah. And we'll send it out as, we'll send it out as well in Praxis Weekly over the next little while. So. Yeah, no, that'd be great. Um, but yeah, no, we have a great lineup of people kind of uh, focusing on work sort of internationally and nationally. So we have uh, Cheryl Bear, Roxy Cavey, Brian Dirksen, uh, Anu George, Kanjana Topol, who you'll be hearing from in a few minutes, uh, Jeremy Johnson, and Yal Purby. And they're all people who are very passionate about the work of justice. And uh, yeah, their work focuses internationally, locally, nationally. Um, so the conference is free. Um, it's three days long, technically. It's kind of a watch at your own pace, so you don't have to be on your computer for three days in a row. Yeah. Um, there's also a bit of a live element as well. Uh, so yeah, sign up, entirely free. We'd love to see you guys there. Yeah, and it's so great, like, you know, obviously this season has not been fun, but there's also, I think, uh, like just with COVID, but I think there's actually ways in which people can dial in instead of having to go to a place, you know, Toronto or Vancouver for a conference like this. The cool thing is for, uh, you know, those of us on the ground that may not be able to get to a physical place, this has been the great opportunity to, through COVID to engage in a high quality conference. So we do encourage you to register. And again, we'll, we'll send that out. Why don't you do this, Cam? We got a couple things coming here. Um, do you want to tee us up? Uh, just some of the things we'll be learning and, and seeing over the next couple minutes, and then we'll uh, jump into that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so we're going to watch a couple of videos um, just that IJM has helped uh, put together. Um, so the first one's actually going to be an animated sort of um, video that's actually narrated by our global CEO and founder, Gary Haugen. Uh, and so it's kind of explaining uh, the role of the people of God and being prophetic of speaking out uh, against uh, violence and injustice. So he kind of covers the ground all the way from Genesis uh, throughout the whole Bible to Revelation about you know, the role of the people of God in being uh, prophetic voices. Uh, so we're going to watch that, and then we actually have uh, a great um, pre-recorded video sermon from our uh, IGM Canada Executive Director, Anu George Kanjana Topol. Uh, she is, was born and raised in India, worked for IJM in India, really was on the front lines in rescuing people um, from slavery. So we're going to hear a bit of uh, scriptural uh, reflection from her and just some stories about the people that she's um, helped to rescue and restore from bonded labor slavery, so. The Bible tells us that the fall unleashed a horrible sin into the world, the sin of violence. It begins with Cain killing Abel and gets so bad that by the time of Noah, God says he's going to end the whole human story with a flood because humans have filled the earth with violence. Ultimately, God decides not to end the human race. Instead, he begins working his long-term plan to redeem all of creation through the reign of his son, King Jesus, who will personally establish a new heaven and a new earth where every tear is wiped away and there is no more death or mourning or crying or pain. This is how we know the story will end. But in the meantime, this sin of violence constantly threatens to get out of control. So in the ancient biblical story, God comes up with a temporary solution to restrain the violence. He gives a measure of coercive power, sometimes called the sword, to government rulers so they can use that power to protect the vulnerable from the violence of the strong. This idea of the ruler as protector is celebrated over and over again in the Bible. Endow the king with justice, O God. May he defend the cause of the poor, give deliverance to the needy, and crush the oppressor. As the Apostle Paul writes, there is no governing authority except from God, for the ruler bears the sword to punish those who do evil. Later, great theologians like Augustine, Aquinas, Luther, Calvin, Wesley, and Bonhoeffer would disagree on lots of things, but they all agree on the most basic purpose of rulers, to restrain violence against the weak. 
In fact, when rulers used their power to restrain violence, even pagan rulers like King Cyrus or Nebuchadnezzar or Caesar, the Bible calls them God's instruments, his agents, or even God's ministers. But right away in the Bible story, a huge problem with God's solution arises. What if the rulers are failing to do their God-appointed job of restraining violence against the woman? Or worse, what if the rulers are committing the violence themselves? For instance, what if Joseph, the ruler in Egypt who's protecting the Israelites, dies and a new king decides to enslave the Israelites? God's solution for this problem is to raise up a prophet. That is a spokesperson who will remind the ruler that he's accountable to God and will call the ruler to account. And in the case of Egypt, God raises up the prophet Moses to confront Pharaoh. When the ruler fails to do his job, God raises up a prophet to protect the vulnerable and the Israelites are rescued from the violence of slavery. Of course, when the Israelites leave Egypt, they eventually start fighting amongst themselves. And so Moses appoints a thousand magistrates to settle their conflicts with a specific mandate to be fair to the weak. Eventually, the Israelites grow into a nation and they want their own king. God warns them through the prophet Samuel that putting a human king on the throne will present serious dangers, dangers of idolatry and injustice. A king will be tempted to worship idols and will be tempted to abuse his power to oppress you, to steal from you, and to enslave you. The Israelites decide they want to take their chances. And so the Bible story for the next 700 years is pretty tragic. If you step back and look at it, it's the story of hundreds of years of mostly bad kings who lead in idolatry and injustice and don't restrain violence against the weak. And it's the story of the prophets who call them back to their godly purpose. By the way, about half a dozen of these prophets and judges in the Bible narrative are women. Now things start out pretty good with good King David, but even he has to be confronted by the prophet Nathan for abusing his power to commit adultery or rape and murder. Then King David also is condemned for failing to punish Amnon for the rape of Tamar. But then things get even worse. The book of First and Second Kings is about Solomon and 40 other kings of Israel and Judah who lead in idolatry and injustice, namely slavery, murder, theft, and child sacrifice. And it's the story of hundreds of prophets who confront the rulers for shedding innocent blood. This continues to be the basic storyline throughout the rest of the Bible. Prophets confronting the rulers for their failure to do their God-given job of stopping violence. Isaiah confronts the kings of Israel because their hands are stained with blood. Jeremiah confronts the kings of Israel and Babylon because their clothes are soaked with the lifeblood of the innocent poor, and they do not seek justice or defend the cause of the poor. Ezekiel cries out against the rulers of Jerusalem who are like wolves tearing their prey. They kill people to make unjust gain. The prophet Hosea calls King Jeroboam to account because under his rule, there's only lying, murder, stealing, and adultery, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. The prophet Joel pronounces God's judgment against the kings of Egypt and Edom because of violence done to the people and the shedding of innocent blood. The prophet Amos calls the kings of Judah to account for debt slavery, for trampling the needy, and for taking bribes and depriving the poor of justice in the courts. The prophet Obadiah confronts the rulers of Edom for complicity in slaughter, violence, and slavery. And for what sin was Jonah sent to confront the Assyrian king of Nineveh? For their evil ways and the violence of their hands. Micah calls out the rulers of Judah because their rich people are violent and their judges ask for a bribe and pervert justice. The prophet Nahum pronounces God's judgment on the Assyrian king for running a city of bloodshed and endless cruelty. The entire book of Habakkuk 
expresses God's hatred for rulers who build a city with bloodshed and establish a city by injustice. Nehemiah raises his prophetic voice to stop the Jewish nobles and officials who are allowing the rape and enslavement of the weak in their own community. Zephaniah pronounces God's judgment on the kings of Judah who fill their homes with the evil gain of violence and fraud. Zechariah tells the deputies of the king who want to talk about religious fasting that what really matters is whether they administer justice. Do not oppress the widow or orphan, the foreigner or the poor. The prophet Malachi warns the rulers of Israel returning from exile that God will be swift to bear witness against those who oppress the hired workers, the widow, the orphan, and the alien. This prophetic ministry to rulers continues right into the New Testament with John the Baptist, who does call all the people to repentance, but he names three specifically. The tax collectors who are robbing the people, the soldiers who are extorting money from the people, and King Herod who is stealing another man's wife. All of them are rulers abusing the power God has allowed them to have. And of course, the climactic story of the New Testament itself is the crucifixion of Christ under Pontius Pilate. Indeed, the centerpiece of cosmic history is an act of violence and the complicity of government rulers in that violence. Anyone who thinks God doesn't care about how government rulers use their power and whether they use their power to protect the poor or hurt the poor, such a person simply may not be familiar with the God of the Bible. Hi, my name is Anu George Kanjana and so delighted to have the honor of sharing with you today. I'm the Executive Director of International Justice Mission Canada. International Justice Mission exists to end slavery in our lifetime. We do this by rescuing and restoring victims, bringing criminals to justice and strengthening the justice system around the world. Our offices around the world addresses different types of casework ranging from forced labor to sex trafficking. Before moving to Canada, I was working in the field office of IGM in Chennai and Delhi. My team and I have had to see grave evils in our line of work. The atrocities going on around the world are definitely tragic. Our work is hard, our work is heavy, but my goodness, it is worth it. Before we jump in, can we just acknowledge how hard the season has been? I mean, COVID-19 has taken all of our lives and rhythms and flipped them on their heads. Little things like going to the grocery store now takes an extra moment of thought. Do I have my face mask with me? Will the groceries still be out of what I need? Should I have them delivered to my house? And so on. It has affected our relationships. No more than 10 people. And you must be at least six feet apart. And then there is Zoom, the thing that we all need at this time, but the thing that we simultaneously hate. From weak connections to drop calls, None of us, absolutely none of us, were prepared or expected this season of life. And yet, here, here we are. I say this to make a point. COVID-19 has been and continues to be a mammoth-sized disruption. But one thing that can often be forgotten in this season is that there are millions still enslaved around the world. And a global pandemic only amplifies the dehumanization and unfair treatment of those subjected to the enslavement. Forgetting is easier now more than ever because the rest of us are locked in our homes, trying to stay safe ourselves. But we can't forget. Lives are depending on us to not forget. Today, we will be looking at Luke 18, 1 to 8, Jesus' parable about the persistent widow. I don't know about you, but there is something about the parable of the persistent widow that continues to strike a chord with me. But let's dig into the text first, and then I'll explain what I mean. And he told them a parable to the effect that 
They ought to always pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says and will not God give justice to his elect who cried to him day and night. Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the son of man comes, will he find faith on earth? The parable of the persistent widow is one of the few parables where Jesus tells the disciples what the takeaway point is at at the onset of the story. He says, always pray and don't give up. We will come back to this point, but I do want us to make note of how seemingly simple this command was. And yet, it may be one of the more difficult things God asks us to do because of all that is required for us to do this faithfully. I think it is worth us noting that while the woman did eventually receive the justice that she was looking for, she did not receive it immediately. This goes back to my earlier point. How often do we give up on prayer? How often do we give up on bringing our request to the God because he's not responding on our timeline? And that's to our father who promises to supply justice. It's in his nature. It is in our inheritance and yet we give up on him. Is it perhaps because we're so focused on ourselves and our request that when we don't get what we want on our timeline, we move on? Then why didn't the woman, why didn't this woman, a widow, why did she come to the judge repeatedly? She laid down all her sense of pride, cried out in sheer desperation because she had nothing left to do. No other option but to put all our hope in the possibility that the judge would display an act of justice on her behalf. Sometimes justice is delayed, but it does not change the promise God made us that justice is in fact coming. That delay is in fact God's time. If it's okay with you, I'd like to share a story to better help me illustrate what it looks like to wait for justice. Do you remember when I said that there was something about this specific parable that strikes a chord with me? It's because I do know a persistent widow. Her name is Urmila. Urmila had three daughters when her husband died. She had no idea how she was going to take care of them, how she was going to feed them, clothe them, pay for schooling. Her husband was offered a small loan, an advance from a trafficker, someone who preyed on the marginalized, like the struggling widow. This advance trapped Urmila's husband, Urmila, and her entire family. She was married into slavery. Her children were born into slavery. And in an instant, they were all modern day slaves. They were now bound to work endless hours and the wages went straight back to pay the loan. This is what we call modern day slavery. Entire families work together to try to pay back a single loan and the children, grandchildren that are oftentimes born into the situations inheritance, inherit their parents' plight. The original amount of Urmila's husband's loan was no more than equivalent of $40. But as years tick by, Urmila kept seeking to make a better life for herself and her children. Unfortunately, it was too late. She was stuck and sucked into the vicious cycle that is real for millions in India. Every factory that she was sold into, moved back to, promised her a better wage, better life. All of that was empty. Her debt just continued to increase. The factory that my team and I found Urmila in, those who were trapped in slavery received an hour break somewhere in between their 18 to 20 hours of labor. The slave master held quotas that if unmet resulted in severe abuse of those at the factory. The Urmila was old. She was forced to carry bricks. I don't mean one at a time. I don't even mean in her arms. They forced her to carry bricks 
stacked 10 to 12 high, one over another on her head. She was in her 70s. While she carried bricks on her head, her five-year-old grandchild spent the, spent the days turning bricks in the sun. This was Urmila's life. For decades, day after day, year after year, she toiled, waiting for a day that justice would come knocking on her door. Till IGM and the team found the 75-year-old Urmila in the factory. You know, I just, I remember something that I think we're quite prone to forget when I study the story of the persistent widow. Oftentimes when we pray to God, desperately pleading for him to move, for him to deliver justice, he doesn't do it when we want him to. So oftentimes we simply stop coming to him. We give up. We hang our heads and shuffle away from the Lord. Convinced that he doesn't care. I have been convicted by this passage that this posture is wrong. Our God always cares because he's our father and a good father cares for his children, even if he doesn't give them what they want, when they want it. As children, our, our response, the typical response is to trust. But this is far more easier said than done. Sometimes it's not that God is silent to us. Sometimes it's just that his justice seems delayed. Other times he delivers to justice, but we simply don't get to see it. But the question then stands, is that okay? Are we okay to simply rest in knowing that we are children of a good God who promises that justice will be had because he's a good and righteous judge? My question for you and myself is, are we okay with this? Are we okay with merely trusting that God is in fact faithful to his word? You know, I'd like to finish Urmila's story. As if her freedom wasn't enough, God promises to do more than we can ever begin to imagine. And he did just that with Urmila. After her decades of heart-wrenching, back-breaking hardship, when she did receive her freedom, one of our partners realized that she, along with other laborers, did not have a voter's ID card. You know, we oftentimes take voting for granted, like it's a mere civic duty, but we know is important, but we don't focus much on it. Well, for Urmila, having a voter's ID card meant more than just voting. Without the card, under Indian law, she couldn't receive a pension, and she was entitled to two, both an elderly pension and a widow's pension. But without a voter's ID card, she couldn't prove who she actually was. The social worker helping Urmila walked her through getting her voter ID card. And on April 10, 2014, six years ago, Urmila went to the polls for the first time in her 75 years of life. God not only liberated her from the constant abuse and oppression that had pinned her down for so long, but he truly did something more than she could have ever imagined. Honoring his promise to us in scripture to restore the years that the locust had stolen. Urmila fought to believe and to have faith, to keep praying, trusting that God would honor his word. She prayed and had faith for decade after decade after decade. Will we be able to do the same? When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find it in you? Will he find it in me? I hope so. I hope that no matter what the situation is for you today, no matter how bleak things feel, that we are able to push past the disappointments and fight to keep the faith. Urmila fought to keep the faith. I'd like to show a quick video of the heartbreaking reality that so many people face every single day in my home in India. When we talk about ending slavery in our lifetime, it is because we know that there have been centuries of slavery since the beginning of time. But it continues to take a different form. The forced labor slavery that occurs in the Britain throughout India looks a bit like this. This guy had a little girl and he was a slave in a brick kiln. The, the slave owner would not let him leave when his daughter was sick to seek medical treatment. And they said, you know what, she'll be fine, nothing will happen to her, just keep working. 
She turned for the worst. They begged to leave. He said, no, 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 no. Uh, finish your work first. And then his daughter died. And he literally had to, to bury her at the brick kiln. And the owner wouldn't even let him bury his own daughter until after he had finished making his bricks. Bonded labor is slavery, where you're actually working out your loan and lose all the freedom that you have. It is usually on the basis of an advance, but then you belong to the owner after that. There is absolute restricted freedom of movement, restricted freedom of employment. You don't get the wages that you deserve. Somebody owns you and everything that you make. We have seen people trapped for generations on the basis of a very small loan amount, as small as three or five dollars. There are millions of people trapped under slavery, waiting for someone to show up. We are coming. We will find you. And we will free you. We will persevere till all are free. We will persevere until all are free, but all are still not free. I know of another woman who was enslaved by the brickling industry. This woman's strength is unrivaled. Gauri. She has become a dear friend to me over the years. Her, the wrinkles on her face had stories of significant pain, but when she smiles, it all disappears. Her eyes light up because she knows hope. When we met Gauri, she had already been enslaved for 10 years, also in India. It all started similarly to Urmila, with a desire to leave poverty behind and give her children a chance at a better life. Before becoming a widow, Gauri's husband Kumar had been working in a brick room. After Gauri gave birth to her, their first child, Kumar went to his bosses and asked for an advance to cover Gauri's medical expenses. He was seeking 25,000 rupees, about 341 USD. The owner granted Kumar's request with a condition that the only type of repayment he would give was in form of manual labor by Kumar and Gauri. And so Kumar and Gauri agreed on this arrangement. And that is how they became slaves. If this sounds similar to Urmila's story, good. It means you're listening. Far too often, this is the story, same story, different characters, thousands upon thousands of people merely looking to provide a better life for their families. In seeking to do so, they become trapped. The owner of the brick kiln paid Gauri and Kumar 15 rupees, about 20 cents per person per day, making sure that they would never be able to repay their debt. They could hardly pay to feed their children. And so it began. Every day, the laborer cut six tons of wood by hand and loaded it for shipment. If you're injured, the owner would add more debt to your account and it would cover the cost for treatment. If you were even allowed to receive a treatment, that is. When Gauri wanted to enroll her oldest daughter in school, the owner not only refused by force, but forced the girl to work by cleaning the branches, trunks and roots of the trees they used for wood. She was five years old. To make matters worse, the owner was physically abusive. Gauri is a mother like me, and like many of you. So she fought, not for herself, oh no. She fought for her children. She insisted on freedom, on justice, and was relentless in her fight to get it. But I want you to make a note of something, friends. It was a fight. Gauri stood up to the owner because she believed that everyone around her was entitled to basic human rights. But as any good mom does, she made a point to stand for her family. Unfortunately, this enraged the owner who then tied her in a cowshed for an entire day as punishment. He beat her and kicked her in the stomach. Her hands and legs were tied to a pole. She couldn't get up because she had been in a sitting position the entire day that she was in the cowshed. Gauri told IGM's aftercare workers that she used to wonder if someone would rescue her. 
she said she felt as if God had abandoned her. She then admitted to the numerous times she cried her sorrows all alone. She could have given up. She could have said, this is my life and this is all it will ever be. She could have just given up on living altogether, but no, she didn't. She fought back. She was relentless, just like the persistent widow. You see, being relentless means that you don't give up even when it's difficult. Even when you keep getting beaten down, it means you keep getting up. You keep praying. You keep having faith in the God who sits on the throne today, tomorrow and forever. And you trust that the very promises he made his beloved church, he will see to its completion. To better illustrate her pursuit of justice, please watch the short video of Gauri with me. எனக்காக எந்த எதிர்காலமும் நினைவு இல்லை என் பிள்ளைங்களோட நினைவு தான் எனக்கு அத்தைங்களை பாதுகாப்பாம சீரழிஞ்சு உருவங்க வந்து தாய் கிடையாது சொன்னாங்க <laughs> நியாயமா வேலை வாங்கிக்கும் நியாயமா கூலி கொடு அவங்கள வந்து ஒரு பல்லம் சொல்ல சொல்லக்கூடாது எதுவும் கேட்கக்கூடாது என்னை பாதுகாத்தது யாருமே இல்லை அந்த டைம்ல என்னை காப்பாற்றும் யாரும் இல்லை அந்த ஆள் அந்த வேலை செய்யும் போது அதையும் நம்மள யாருனா காப்பாற்ற மாட்டாங்களா செய்ய மாட்டாங்களா கடவுளெல்லாம் நிறைய வேண்டியிருக்கேன் அடிச்சது எங்க அடிச்சது நான் தான் சொல்லிட்டு என் மூணு பிள்ளைங்களும் ஓன் ஆயிடுச்சு அந்த கோவத்தோட போயிட்டு நான் தானே சண்டை போட்டேன் ஏன் என் பிள்ளைங்க அடிக்கிற எதுக்காக அடிக்கிற என்னை மின்னா விட்டுட்டு அந்த ஆள் பின்னாடி வந்து கட்டையால அடிச்சு எனக்கு இப்ப அந்த தைரியம் எப்படி வந்துச்சுன்னா அந்த ஆள் அடிச்சதுனால தைரியம் வந்துச்சு எந்த தவறும் இல்லாம அந்த ஆள் மேல தப்பு இருந்தா நம்ம கேட்கலாம் நியாயம் ரொம்ப பக்கம் இருக்குது எதனால நம்பணும்னா அங்க வந்து ஒரு வாட்டி நாங்க போன் பண்ணும் போது எங்களை வந்து பார்த்தாங்க எனக்கு தைரியம் சொன்னாங்க நீ பயப்படாத கௌரி உனக்கு பக்கத்தோனே நாங்கள் இருக்கோம் நாங்கள் கண்டிப்பாக உன்னை காப்பாற்றுவோம் நீங்கள் நல்லா இருக்கணும் தான் நாங்களா வேண்டுங்க ரொம்ப சந்தோஷமாக இருக்கேன் ஏன்னா என் பிள்ளைங்க படிக்கிறதுனால எனக்கு இன்னும் ரொம்ப சந்தோஷமாக இருக்கேன் நான் என்ன நான் நான் ஏற்று கற்றுக்குதுங்க நல்லா சந்தோஷமாக இருக்குதுங்க எதுனா ஒரு கம்பெனி வேலைக்கு போகணும் எதுனா ஒரு டாக்டர் ஆகணும் எதுனா டீச்சர் ஆகணும் அதுக்கு நல்லா படித்து நல்லா நெகலில் தான் வேலை செய்யணுமே தவிர என்ன மாரி சுதந்திரமா நிம்மதியாக சந்தோஷமாக இருக்கேன் நாலு பேர்கிட்ட நல்லா பேசுகிறேன் சிதிக்கிறேன் ஆடம்பரமாக இருக்கேன் ஒரு தாயாக இருக்கிறதுனால எனக்கு ரொம்ப பெருமையாக இருக்குது There is a piece to Gauri's story that the video does not capture. But I want to make sure that we take note of that today. Once Gauri and her fellow slaves were rescued, the former owner began harassing them daily. He went so far as to threaten to burn down their homes while they were gone. 
they feared an end. So even when justice was delivered to them, life didn't instantly become easy. Their lives were still incredibly difficult and they still felt trapped and enslaved by this monstrous slave master. But what the video does show us is that Gauri prayed. She prayed and she never stopped. She never stopped. She never stopped. After Gauri's husband died and she became a widow, she didn't see her new status as a crutch. Instead, she was even more emboldened to fight for justice on behalf of others. Today, Gauri shares a story to those in her community. She counsels other women in her church, specifically those experiencing domestic violence. She brings great strength and empathy as she sits with them to provide both physical and emotional support. Why? Because that's the call of the church, to pursue justice for others relentlessly, to continuously go back to God in prayer, in faith, that his heart is for justice. And dear friends, it is. Our father's heart is for justice. It is in our inheritance as his children. But we must be both persistent and relentless as we pursue it. May we be like the persistent widow. May we have faith when we pray, expectant of what our God, our Father will do. And now, my friends, I would love to invite you to join us in the work of justice. You see, the stories I've shared today are nothing short of miracles, but each miracle is made possible by the movement of God and the work of His people. At IJM, our work wouldn't be possible without prayer. In fact, the work of justice begins with prayer. As we seek justice on behalf of others, we rely on an all-powerful God to help us do what is only possible with and through Him. We rely on the support of our global prayer partners and prayer communities as we work in areas of great darkness and serve those in desperate need of rescue and restoration. By signing up to become an IGM prayer partner, you will receive weekly updates on our work and opportunities to pray for the global work of IGM. You will also have access to IGM prayer resources as well as opportunities to join special Pray for Justice events. You can sign up today at IJM.ca slash prayer. Along with becoming a prayer partner, I also want to invite you in supporting IGM's work financially. It is our great hope to raise $24,600 this year to fund three rescue operations to rescue and restore people trapped in bondage labor slavery like Urmila and Gauri. You and your church can provide everything that our field teams need, from initial investigations to immediate aftercare, to rescuing children and families from slavery. Funding a rescue operation will help us investigate cases with local law enforcement, bring children and families to safety, and collect evidence to effectively prosecute slave owners. Give today at igm.ca slash rescue hyphen operation. Your gifts, no matter how big or small, will help send rescue to those trapped in bond labor slavery today. Thank you for joining me today on Freedom Sunday, and thank you for supporting the global work of justice through IGM Canada. Let us pray.